Good morning uh, and welcome to uh, the Brookings Institution. And uh, on behalf of the African Growth Initiative and the Brookings, uh, I would like to welcome you to this exciting event on Foresight Africa 2013. Uh, we've been holding uh, these events now for three years. We've been producing an annual publication, and this is the third one uh, that we've been looking, looking forward to what we expect to be most important issues and events uh, that will impact, uh, would impact Africa's uh, development. And uh, so the publication, you, most of you have the publication, but we hold the event also to discuss many other issues that we consider to be very uh, uh, relevant to development uh, in Africa. And uh, I am very grateful to our panelists uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, we know that uh, we have uh, uh, a distinguished panel uh, who will be introduced uh, shortly. Um, <coughs> Uh, the, uh, this, uh, the events that we've been holding have actually been in, in very useful to us to think about even the issues that we need to be working on in terms of research and in terms of advising uh, what issues that government should be looking at. And this year we have uh, selected a few topics that you will see in the report uh, that uh, we identify to be crucial that uh, many governments should be looking at, to, and those that will affect the development uh, in Africa. And we are looking forward now to more discussions with the experts and people who have been looking at issues on Africa, and we look forward to your participation. So we are very grateful uh, for your coming to this particular event. So I am particularly grateful to the panelists and those who will be introduced and uh, much more so to the uh, um, moderator of this event, Aisha Sese, who is, uh, uh, most of you know who she is. Uh, she is an anchor and correspondent of CNN and appears appearing on programs across CNN International, Headline News and CNN US. She anchors CNN News Center, <coughs> news Center a weekday news program that takes viewers through the day's big stories of global importance. She also hosts Backstory, the weekly program that goes behind the scenes of CNN's global news gathering operation and often files reports of African voices. During this, the week, she also provides news updates for the 280 edition of Anderson Cooper 2360, which is broadcast around the world. She has done exclusive interviews with the Nigerian president, Goodluck Jonathan, Kenya Prime Minister Laira Odiga, Pre Pre President uh, Wade of Senegal, Liberian President Erin Johnson Sarif, and President Ernest Bai Kaloma of Sierra Leone. So I'm very grateful to welcome uh, uh, Isha, who we will actually uh, uh, moderate this event. And I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Aisha. If you don't know why, uh, <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the audience, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for throwing me under the bus there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, it is really great to be here with you uh, on this rather chilly morning here in Washington, DC. Um, but it is good to be with so many people here to talk about Africa. Um, I love the continent. I care passionately about it. Um, many of you may know that uh, I spent my formative years, I grew up in Sierra Leone in West Africa. My family still lives there. It is still home for me. So to have the opportunity to be with so many people who care about the continent, so many um, great thinkers um, who are pondering on the big questions about how the continent moves forward, it's, it's a great honor for me to be here with you all today. Um, I get very excited when I read the reports, when I see the stats that say Africa's on the rise, when you see that uh, between 2001, 2010, six of, of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world were in Africa. But the question is, how do we make that, uh, that economic growth and development inclusive? How do you turbocharge that so that uh, you know, it, it raises up the, li the living standards of the millions on the continent? what should the continent's priorities be in 2013? And we have some great people here, including Jeffrey Sachs, in case you haven't noticed, these are there. And we do see you, Jeffrey, up on the screen already. Um, he's, he's joining us along with uh, Laura C., Steve Radlett, and Jeffrey here to, to grapple with that. Let me give you a formal introduction of our panelists. I'm gonna start with Steve Radlett here. 
Uh, he's a distinguished professor in the practice of development at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service, where he specializes in economic growth in developing countries, poverty reduction, foreign aid, debt, and trade. Uh, Professor Radlett also has extensive experience as a policymaker in the U.S. government, and he acts as an advisor to developing country leaders, also the author and co-author of many, many books. I'm going to, so you don't have to blush, I'm going to move on now. <laughs> My mother would be proud. She great. would be proud, and she should be. <laughs> Laura C. is an assistant professor of political science at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, where I'm based. So. Atlanta is representing this morning. Her research is centered around the study of community responses to conflict and U.S. foreign policy in Africa's Great Lakes region. Her research and teaching interests include African politics and development, conflict and conflict resolution, and international organizations. You should follow her. Check out her blog. It's pretty impressive. She blogs about African politics, development, and security as Texas in Africa. She's also a contributor to Christian Science Monitor's African Monitor blog and The Atlantic. And Jeffrey Sachs is also joining us thanks to the wonders of modern technology. And he's been called probably the most important economist in the world by the New York Times. He is the director of the Earth Institute, Quedlet Professor of Sustainable Development and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. He's also a special advisor to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the Millennium Development Goals. And he's received more than 20 honorary degrees, awards and honors from around the world. So. I just want to thank all of you for being here this morning with us and helping us really tackle this issue. To give you a sense of how today's going to work, each of the panelists will make a presentation for about five to seven minutes. They're going to speak. After they're done, I'm going to get the conversation going and ask a round of questions to, to really, you know, as I say, warm things up. Then I'm going to open it up to you here in the room. Um, if you want to ask a question, make a comment, please raise your hand, wait for me to call on you, a microphone will make its way to you, introduce yourself, say where you're from, and give us your question or your comment. Please keep these brief, succinct. Um, if you start to ramble, I will bring you back on track. Um, it is a promise. Uh, so <laughs> there, there you have it. I really want this to be dynamic. I really want us all to engage. Um, I always say when I do these events, you get out what you put in. So please, I'm expecting you to invest in all of this. I should also make clear that this is being filmed. So everything you do and say for the next 90 minutes is recorded for posterity. And so you can't deny it. Um, so, <laughs> so I hope that we're going to have a, a good 90 minutes, a good conversation. I'm going to ask. Laura C. to kick things off. Laura. Well, thank you so much, Aisha, and thank you to the Brookings Institution and everyone at the, at the Africa Growth Initiative. Um, it's really wonderful to see Brookings uh, taking a stronger role these last few years in, in dealing with Africa policy, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a much needed, neutral and independent, um, trustworthy voice in, in thinking about policy issues. So, so it's a really a pleasure to be here. Um, my comments are going to largely be about the connection between some of the issues raised in the Foresight Africa report um, and conflict and, and what we can expect and what needs to happen to mitigate the effects of and, and address the causes of conflict in Africa in the coming year. Um, both Page and Watkins, um, in focusing on educational issues, are talking about what I think is one of really the key issues affecting Africa today. And that is the fact that while there have been great improvements um, under the Millennium Development Goals of getting children into school, um, and I don't want to, to say that that is not a good thing. It is a very good thing that millions more children in Africa are in school. But that there are significant problems with what they are learning, with the quality of instruction, and with curriculum. Um, students are not coming out of school with basic literacy and numeracy skills. They are not coming out of school um, with critical thinking skills, the, the kinds of critical thinking um, abilities that are absolutely necessary for the sorts of jobs that other authors in the report talk about as being important to Africa's future. And particularly as we think about innovation, um, as we think about technology and, and the growth of technology hubs in Africa, um, certainly the growth of mobile money, you know, being something that basically originated in Kenya, um, students need those skills. And so I think that education and particularly curriculum reform at national levels has to be a priority in Africa going forward. Um, as many of you know, most education systems in Africa 
are, are based on inherited colonial programs. Um, and due to things like lack of textbooks, poor teacher training, uh, most of it relies on rote memorization of facts. Um, I can tell you in Congo, when, when I'm doing field research there, as a graduate student, when I would tell people I was from Texas, um, there was this amazing thing that happened. People would all start to recite the same thing. And it was um, a comment about Texas in the Paleozoic era and the ancient Permian Sea that used to cover West Texas. Um, and I, I was sort of like, what is this? You know, But it turned out it was part of the, the curriculum, and everyone had memorized that. Uh, when they were in primary school. Um, you know, it's, it's good that you know that about, about Texas, but um, that's not giving you the skills that you need to move forward and to think critically and to, to express yourself in the modern world. And so I think that this is tied directly to issues of conflict um, in Africa. You know, young people who do not get an education and who do not perceive correctly, perceive that there are no uh, educational opportunities for them going forward. Um, in many fragile states, the rational and lucrative choice is to join a militant group. Um, joining a militant group means you have some guarantee of food, it means you have some guarantee of power, it means you have something to do. This, this becomes a very difficult choice for young boys in, in places like the Congo, for example. Um, and I think that we, we really need to start thinking about um, tying these issues of, of development to conflict and, and particularly in thinking about educational opportunities and what kinds of work that is preparing people to do and how we can discourage engaging in, in these sorts of bad behaviors and also create people who are thinking of creative solutions um, to local problems within their own communities and, and have the skills necessary to come up with, with peace building opportunities, with economic alternatives, um, these sorts of things. Um, in terms of kind of thinking about what's ahead, I mean, I think that, that it's pretty clear where the, the flashpoints of crisis are. Uh, DRC is going to continue to be a problem. The Central African Republic has really um, blown up over the last two weeks and, and is not looking good. And then, of course, we have the crisis in Mali um, and the broader issue of Islamism and extremists, Islamic extremists in the Sahel. Um, Richard Joseph speaks some about the issue of DRC and talks about Herbst and Pham's work on um, arguing that, that the solution in many of these crises is to forget the old colonial borders um, and, and to kind of create um, new states. I think that, that, that this is a somewhat problematic notion and something I would, I would push back against. Um, it really, you know, I mean, I, I view the, the root causes of conflict in these areas largely as having to do with things like land rights, with equitable access to development. Um, it's hard to tell what the Seleka rebels are up to in, in CAR. They haven't been very specific about what they want other than for, for President Bozize to go. But um, one of the things we know is that they are all representing ethnic groups and, and are from areas of the country that have been excluded from, from development. Um, and in thinking about things like, well, saying that the solution to this is to, to let the, the country break up, I think that ignores the, the fact that, that many people in these countries do not want their countries to, to be dissolved, certainly in the Congo. Um, national identity is very, very strong. Um, and, and it really defies you know, the fact that you probably haven't spoken with any Congolese if you say that the solution to their problems is, is to break up the country. Um, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we were, we were talking about the problem of national identity not being strong enough in Africa and that this was kind of causing problems in, in places like Kenya or in Sierra Leone and that you know, if we could just get people to, to identify first as citizens of the country and then by their ethnic group, all of our problems would be solved. Well, we, we have places now where national identity is much stronger than it was um, even 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I think that, that it really is, is problematic to start saying that you, know, you just breaking up these countries is, is the way to go because it's not what people in those countries want. Um, even if that's something that seems like an ideal solution from the outside. So, so what should we do? Um, and I think that really something to think about going forward is this issue of decentralization um, and state building, but, but doing state building from the ground up rather than the top down. Um, you know, I think Professor Kimeni notes in his, in his piece that you do have problems in, in decentralization issues of needing to have an equitable distribution of resources, needing to have balance, particularly balancing the concerns of minority ethnic groups. Um, but I think if there's, if there's any lesson we've learned, you know, it's that breaking up countries into, into smaller states can pose very ch serious challenges um, for development. And it's hard to say, you know, South Sudan, it's, it's an open question as to whether South Sudan is going to make it as an independent country. Um, 
but smaller states, and these smaller states are not guaranteed to be viable. I mean, it's very hard for me to see a, a state of Kivu being, um, being a viable situation in, in Congo. There's just too many issues. Um, and I think that you know, we really need to think more creatively about how we can support decentralization, how we can fund it, how we can ensure that those funds are well used, um, and how all of that can be used to support real development going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. Steve. Good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me here. Nice to see everybody here. Glad to see Jeff. I hope that the, uh, that the technology works. <clears throat> I was telling the others earlier, uh, it reminds me of a time in 1997, Jeff and I were at Harvard, he was my boss at the Harvard Institute for International Development, and Jeff was scheduled to give a lecture one Monday morning, but he was stuck in Detroit with the snowstorm. And as the time approached and got started, his uh, trusted assistant, Martha Sinnott, came down to my office, knocked on the door, laughing her head off, said, you've got to see this. So I followed her down the hall to this big conference room, there are about 25 graduate students all around a table taking notes, looking at this phone in the <laughs> middle of the table that was on speaker. This was in, in the mid-90s when technology was not quite what it is today. And there's Jeff from the Detroit Metropolitan Airport giving this lecture, this very lucid lecture on a pay phone at the airport. <laughs> and as he's talking about... I don't know, European history and the wonders of the glorious revolution in the background, there's now boarding flight 370. <laughs> and these students are sitting there taking these notes, looking at the phone. And uh, so I always remember that and Martha uh, Sinnott wanting to share that with me. So I hope that, Jeff, we don't have any interference from flight calls uh, in the background today. Um, there is a lot to talk about in terms of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it, it's such a diverse place with so many different dynamics in different countries, some very positive, some negative. It's, it's hard to, to summarize here. One thing that I do want to say is how important it is to notice the disaster that didn't happen in sub-Saharan Africa over the last few years in terms of the impacts of the global economic crisis and how well overall African governments have responded to that crisis in terms of their economic management. That's totally different than what happened 20 years ago in response to the last major big global economic crisis where many African governments did not respond particularly well and it led to a very difficult period of tension with the IMF and the World Bank around stabilization structural adjustment programs. Uh, it's remarkable actually how, uh, how well African governments have responded to this crisis and what that says about the improving quality of governance and leadership and economic policy making in Africa. So I wanted to start with that point uh, on an optimistic uh, way to give us some hope. Uh, four challenges that I want to uh, mention. First is sustaining growth in that uh, difficult global economic context. Uh, the IMF uh, projects that growth will continue across the, the subcontinent at about 5.2% uh, next year, which is pretty good. Uh, and, and that's an average, so several countries would be higher than that. Uh, if that can be sustained given the global economic crisis, that's good. Uh, it could be even better, but, uh, but sustaining that growth is going to be really critical. And to do that, I think, is going to require continuing diversification of economic uh, activities. There hasn't been, even, even though growth in Africa really began to take off in the mid-1990s, there's been less economic diversification and movement towards more productive sectors that will create a lot of jobs. John Page writes in the AGI report about the importance of creating jobs, and part of that is to diversify um, uh, economies, and that hasn't happened as much as it, it might have been anticipated, certainly not as much as in, in, as in East Asia uh, uh, 30 years ago when they started their takeoff. That's going to require big investments in agriculture, big investments in power, and continuing uh, opening of trade facilitation of trading relationships. Uh, the United States has now been pushing for the last year the Feed the Future program, which is a long overdue set of investments in agriculture funding. This year globally will be about a billion dollars a year. Uh, and in the context of our budget on the Hill, the ability to actually start a new initiative is, uh, was not easy, pretty, pretty remarkable. But that's just the beginning of the kinds of investments that are going to be needed from around the world and also domestically in terms of strengthening agriculture. Big gaps in power that we all uh, know about uh, and, and big agenda in terms of both regional trade and global trade to, again, create those economic opportunities. 
That's all the more important as trading partners are changing. The old traditional trading partners, mainly Europe and to some extent the United States, those are not the big sources of growth going forward. The new sources of growth are the emerging middle income countries, China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brazil, uh, Argentina, other countries like that. And those trading and investment relationships are just beginning. There's great potential, uh, but those need to be deepened. But it's very difficult for countries and, and companies within Sub-Saharan Africa to change those traditional trading relationships, but that's going to be key going forward. Second big priority uh, is, is continued progress in health. There's been remarkable progress in health. Jeff has been pushing this for a long time with great success. Uh, we're finally getting some progress on malaria. Uh, there's a big agenda still on HIV AIDS. We know that story. We can't forget that as, as other priorities go forward. So I wanted to, to mention that. Uh, third is, is stability, and Laura's already mentioned this a little bit, but we've got the issues in Mali, uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Central African Republic, DRC, and that is the beginning, feels like the beginning of what could be some really uncomfortable movement back towards some uh, instability. I'm quite worried, obviously, as everyone is with the situation in Mali. I'm concerned that it'll spill over to Niger and other countries in the region. Niger, with its recent coup d'etat, its movement back to, uh, to democracy in the last 18 months, but it's very fragile. And the same kinds of dynamics that affected Mali could affect other neighboring countries. Fourth, uh, and finally, is the challenge of deepening democracy. Um, there's been great progress. People are always negative. But last year, Liberia, we had the inauguration of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf for a second term. We had a very smooth transition of power in Ghana, which it, nothing major happened, so it wasn't a news event. It was a huge step forward in democracy. When a head of state can pass away tragically, but there's a smooth transition of power, that's democracy working well, when there's a legitimate transfer of power like that. In Malawi, when, when the former president died again, there was not quite as smooth, but there was a successful transition of power. Uh, some great steps forward in terms of deepening democracy, but there's a long way to go, and one of the biggest events in 2013, of course, will be the elections in Kenya, and, and, and that will have a big impact on East, East Africa going forward. Uh, but that agenda for continuing to deepen democracy uh, continues. Open questions in Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, and many of those in terms of their future economic and social development hinges on democratic uh, transitions. My last point will be all of these challenges are greater in the context of aid flows which are not going up anytime soon, at least in any major way. The United States has, has actually managed in the last three years in the Obama administration to increase funding to sub-Saharan Africa by 10 to 15 percent uh, uh, and, and has really deepened uh, its commitment to, to sub-Saharan Africa on top of the large start that the Bush administration started, but it's going to be very hard to continue that given the budget fights up on the Hill. The opportunities exist, however, with great large new private capital flows and also domestic uh, capital from domestic private investment and increasing revenues from uh, African governments as their incomes rise, their tax take is rising, and so the amount of resources available domestically are also uh, going forward. So there's going to have to be a shift, I think, of thinking about aid flows, how they leverage these other, mon these other funds from private sources, both domestic and foreign, in order to tackle these issues going forward on health, on power, on agriculture, and, and some of these other challenges going forward. Let me leave it there. Thank you, Steve. And Jeff, your time is now. Great. Thanks, uh, Aisha. And uh, thanks, Steve. This is actually a lot more comfortable than uh, standing <laughs> in an airport. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, really delighted to be part of this. Let me just mention some of the initiatives uh, that I'm working on uh, from the UN uh, context uh, that I hope can help to uh, uh, further our discussion this morning. There are six uh, that I want to mention uh, quickly. First is community health workers. We've had a major uh, success in the last 10 years in uh, improving some aspects of uh, health service delivery in extremely difficult, low budget contexts. And one of the lessons uh, has been that community-based healthcare delivery through locally trained village uh, workers can be extremely important. 
We are launching a campaign to try to mobilize one million community health workers in Africa between now and the end of 2015. And I'm hoping that the African Union uh, will endorse this initiative in, at its uh, summit in Addis uh, in January. One of the wonderful uh, points of this, like uh, other things that I'll discuss, is that the IT revolution is empowering uh, this approach uh, to uh, an extent that means uh, every year a dramatic improvement in what can be done. Uh, we now have lots of uh, uh, demonstration models of community health workers backed up by smartphones uh, for delivery of services that I think now can be scaled up very significantly. So that's number one. Number two is electrification, uh, which uh, Steve mentioned. Uh, I think one could have as a basic uh, theorem of development that there can be no modern development without electricity, uh, no matter how much one tries. A certain uh, amount of electricity can be uh, re reasonably and uh, realistically uh, sourced from the grid in uh, the coming years as the grid is extended. Some major uh, hydropower projects would make a huge difference in many parts of Africa. There's going to have to be a lot of electrification that's off-grid as well. And here the dramatic fall of prices of PV uh, can really play a very important role. We are uh, exploring, pushing, uh, testing models of prepay electricity along the lines of uh, prepay mobile phones, and they're very promising. Households pay something on the order of $5 per month for kerosene right now, and for significantly less than that, they can get the same improved lighting services uh, through uh, solar panels uh, and uh, with the cleaner indoor air and an ability to charge their phones. And it probably is the spread of mobile phones that's the most important uh, ground level uh, cause for a soaring demand for electricity. And I think it's a, a very good one because there'll be lots of spillovers from that. The third area that we're working on are some projects with some major mining companies on improving the relations of the mining sector and local communities as well as national governments. We saw in South Africa the true disaster of the South African police shooting into a crowd of protesting miners, killing dozens of them in the context of a mining wage dispute. This is horrendous, tragic, destabilizing and absolutely unnecessary. And a number of the major mining companies know that their social license uh, to uh, produce uh, depends on major reform in how they do business in terms of transparency, accountability, work with local governments, environmental sustainability, uh, and uh, better support for national economic development. So that's a third area that I would uh, highlight. A fourth area is uh, trying to introduce uh, some of the new smart city technologies. Uh, again, uh, heavily uh, leaning on information technology and a much more uh, data-rich environment for urban management. And I'm hoping that, uh, among others, that Accra will become a place where a major smart city initiative can take off. Uh, Steve is absolutely right. Ghana is. Uh, uh, an extremely important country and an important case where a lot of good things are coming together. Uh, not only governance, uh, but also uh, good resource finds, uh, social stability, uh, a geography which is favorable, uh, and an opportunity, I think, for uh, Ghana to be a pioneer on really uh, good information uh, technology-based or led development in important ways. And so I'm hoping that some smart city technologies uh, can get introduced. And finally, again, a point that Steve raised uh, uh, is on smallholder farming. The basic uh, point is that Africa smallholder farmers are producing at this point probably 1.3 to 1.4 tons per hectare, whereas uh, best practice technologies would probably allow for 
two and a half to three tons per hectare, if not more. Africa would be able to feed itself uh, with improved technology systems. And there are uh, lots of uh, examples, small scale. Uh, there was a, a G8 initiative, which uh, Steve referred to an American piece of, which never took off at the scale that was promised in 2009. But the opportunities for smart farming are also improving with a lot of information technology behind that as well. One of the things that we're doing together with the Gates Foundation is very sophisticated soil mapping with handheld devices, mass spectroscopy, and other technologies that now allow for much more precision farming, identification of soil, nutrient needs, and so forth. The sixth initiative that I want to mention is uh, what we call the Drylands Initiative, uh, basically reflecting uh, the fact that the drylands uh, are, are aflame uh, in violence uh, and uh, environmentally. Both the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, in my opinion, are conflicts of hunger, famine, uh, poverty, demographic pressures. They get transmuted through politics. Uh, they become seedbeds of extremism. They become open opportunities for uh, plunder, as happened in uh, northern uh, Mali. But basically, these are very difficult regions where climate and geography work very powerfully against you. Uh, at least up until now, uh, landlocked regions, extremely poor, three to four hundred millimeters of rainfall a year, uh, too little for a crop. Pastoralism is marginalized culturally, economically. Uh, the borders don't work right for pastoralism. There are many, many problems uh, that are distinctive in the drylands belt. And to my mind, it's no accident that from Senegal to Afghanistan, that belt of more than 10,000 miles is really a, a belt of uh, a lot of conflict. Uh, it's a belt of a lot of hunger and the worst poverty in the world. And uh, unless we have a development model that goes along with the politics and the security, we'll never resolve these uh, conflict uh, conditions. So those are uh, six initiatives that I wanted to put on the table. And I'll turn it back to you, Aisha. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, Wangi, if you could add your closing thoughts. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, here at, uh, at the Africa Growth Initiative, we've been looking at uh, a lot of uh, key issues that we consider to be important uh, for Africa's growth, particularly uh, sustaining the growth that we have already experienced in Africa the last uh, decade, uh, or pretty much of a decade. And many of these issues have been mentioned, and I'll just highlight some of the issues, plus several challenges that I see that uh, we need to, to, to highlight. I think uh, one, one issue that is very important for Africa to really continue is uh, the issue of regional integration. Uh, this is something that the, the African Union, the leadership in Africa seems to have understood the importance of uh, they, you know, getting the economies uh, together, breaking down the barriers, uh, which is a big problem for Africa. And again, we, you know, we have talked about a lot about intra-Africa trade, which is very limited, and how we need to trade more, you know, how African countries must trade more with each other uh, to, 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 to generate high income, to specialize, and to exploit what we call the regional value chains, that one country can do better uh, than the other, and, the, and that's where you can create more value. So I think one of the priorities for Africa is to still continue uh, the, this uh, uh, process uh, of what we call the regional integration project, uh, you know, so that we, we reach the, the goals through the regional economic communities and then the continental free trade area, which is an ambitious goal, but I think it's very important for Africa to do that, uh, uh, and, and it should be a priority. And of course, there are challenges doing that, uh, and some of them will require some of the issues that have been talked about here, particular infrastructure, and, uh, and, uh, and we have talked about that in our, in our writings. I think the other issue, and this relates to what Steve talked about, and also the programs that are, are, are being discussed here, including by Jeff, um, that's, that's really the issue of resources and the declining aid. But uh, it seems to me that one, as aid has declined, Africa has continued to discover more natural resources. Virtually now, every country is likely to be exporting major mineral, uh, some resources. Now, the last five years, a lot of countries have become oil exporters or are about to be oil exporters. 
even countries where this was not even, uh, were pretty much thought of, you know, East Africa, for example. Uh, you know, you have Uganda, you have Kenya. And Somalia is supposed to be uh, buying, you know, a lot of uh, resources, Mozambique, a lot of uh, gas. So there is a great opportunity for Africa in terms of natural resources. The problem is that uh, the history uh, doesn't uh, really, is not very good for Africa and richness. And so the big challenge really, and where we, I think we need to invest a lot of resources is on governance of natural resources. As AIDS decline, I think the focus should be how do we really get to govern our natural resources better? And uh, if we do that, we will not have to worry much about the natural resources. And one of the things that we know is that although we talk about aid flows, the amount of money that is stolen from Africa from natural resources is much higher than the aid flows that we get. So if we can actually block this, uh, these resources flowing out, Africa has a lot of resources. So I think as a priority for development uh, is how we manage the natural resources. And I think that's, we need to strategies how we move forward. Uh, we have looked at uh, cases like Ghana, which is going one trajectory. Look at uh, 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 Uganda is going another way. And I think we, there are, will be cases of, of disaster in some cases and successes in the others. I think the other issue that uh, is a real challenge and we have talked about in our foresight and it's very important that we deal with and will probably determine the stability of a lot of African countries is how do you deal with the youth. It's really focusing on the youth and jobs. Uh, in our write-up, uh, uh, John Page writes, talks about that youth jobs is job one. It's the first thing that we should focus on and I agree with that. If you go to Africa this today, although there have been development, there have been a lot of growth and a lot of people are doing very well, you also find that it's really uh, a society that is divided between those who are doing very well and particularly youth who are left out. And I would relate this uh, issue as a challenge of long-term stability. Uh, when, and, and this is another issue that I wanted to relate to, which is the issue of licensing militant groups uh, labels, and different types of groups that have emerged in many countries of Africa. If, even the countries that are doing very well, if you look at those countries, you find that there are no <coughs> uh, youth groups uh, that are involved in a lot of criminal activities. And these are likely to destabilize the country. They are either involved in crime, theft, robberies, and all that. But this can even go to another extent that will be fairly serious. So I would say, even for, uh, for developing partners, uh, uh, for, for, for agencies that are involved in, the, in development. I think focusing on the youth strategies uh, should be a, a primary uh, issue that we should focus on. And these are also our priorities also at our, at our unit here, the ones that I'm talking about. These are some of the issues that we have prioritized for research, uh, working with African government and African research partners. And uh, finally, um, I, I have several other issues here. That, like the food security, I would not fail to miss to say that the challenge of food security will continue to be an issue. As Jeff has highlighted this, and I think this is another strategy combined with the, with the strategy in agriculture and so on that will continue uh, to be a priority that we need to focus on uh, uh, moving from, from where we, we have been uh, periodic farmings and, and so on. But all these have to be hedged on leadership. Uh, the issue of leadership in Africa remains crucial and uh, we, we assume that uh, we have finished our nation building project, but we have not actually achieved a nation, project, nation building project, and our leadership still is, is still an, a problem. Uh, we have talked about travel spots that are likely to, uh, leader issues are likely to escalate in the Central Africa, and the big problem here is that you have these anchor countries you know, in different regions that are not very stable or are, have uh, big, big issues like Nigeria, you have the, the problems in Nigeria, you have DRC problems that are likely to spread in the region. Uh, South Africa is not helping a lot because it has its own you know, growth issues. Uh, and, and, and of course now, the worry about Kenya. Uh, East Africa community is one of the regions that have been doing very well. Uh, the regional integration process has been moving very well. But this can be derailed if we get into serious problems in Kenya. I, I think the, the, where, where we are headed in March, uh, could be very critical for the entire region uh, if it's not handled. If, if this goes one way, as, as in the write-up in our book, in our pamphlet, where we talked about a tipping point for Kenya, it's actually also important for the entire region, including up to South Sudan 
uh, and, and Uganda because we are relying on the, on the movement moving forward with the East African community. So how we deal with the issues uh, where, uh, and, and we, uh, one of the worries, what type of international intervention is really relevant for these type of countries. Now, if you listen to many people talking about Kenya, they see the ICC as a big problem. I mean, some people will see, oh, we need ICC to punish these guys. But at the same time, if you go to the country, what you find is that the International Criminal Court has seemed to spread people. They have united people who would not have been united before. So now you have actually a real problem in the country. Even after the, the election and whoever wins, I think the country will be more divided. And that's something that is worrisome. And we need people who are sober thinkers to figure out how we proceed uh, in that area. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. And I just want to remind our audience, uh, I want to remind all of you that we do have people joining us via webcast and they can follow the conversation during this event at hashtag Foresight Africa. And also I want to remind you all that uh, Mangi is going to do a live Twitter chat five minutes after the event to answer questions. So I've got the housekeeping out of the way. Um, Mangi, to pick up on what you said about sober minds, <laughs> wasn't going to let you get away with that. Um, Talk to me about how we go about solidifying or cementing the gains made in good governance in Africa and the rule of law to make sure that those are permanent and they, they're not rolled back. Okay, I think what has happened is that we have tended to assume uh, that uh, we write good constitutions and that those constitutions are self-enforcing. And once you have a constitution, everything should work well. Actually, it's not true because you have to change. There's a difference between constitutions and constitutionalism, which is an ingrained way of thinking of obeying the law uh, you know, in, in a society. And I think that's lacking in a lot of our countries. We have written constitutions, but we don't have constitutionalism. So I think what we need to do is really go back to the basics of organizing societies from the very low level of society so that we have as a nation where people feel that they are part of the nation. I think now, uh, and I, I'm not afraid to say this, that when I talk to people, when I do service in Africa, we, have, we don't have nations, we have a collection of tribes. Mm -hmm. People still think about themselves as particular ethnic groups more than they think about uh, nations. And until we get to that point of nation building, which we have assumed that we, in the past we assumed that we have a country, it's independent, and we have finished the nation building project. It's not true. I think we have a lot to do from the ground to build a nation more than uh, just passing a uh, constitution. Well, well, let me put that to the panel, the, the point he just made about, as he speaks to people in Africa, the sense that it's in a collective of tribes as opposed to a sense of one nation. Uh, Steve. Uh, I'm not sure I want to touch, uh, uh, <laughs> touch that. <laughs> I, I actually wanted to comment on, on the first part of what he said, which uh, on the resource management. Sure. Um, and, and, uh, and I think the key to that is really a push on transparency. I really believe, um, and have come to believe over the last few years, that the shift towards democracy is, is fundamental to, to Africa's progress and its future, and that a key to strengthening democracy and good governance is transparency. Democracy, at the end of the day, is just one of many methods of, of accountability, of, of a way for citizens to hold their leaders accountable and to to hold your leaders accountable, you need transparency. On natural resource management, uh, there are some key steps that can be made, that can be taken, that, have, that are already underway in many places, to increase transparency. One is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, where mm -hmm. countries themselves commit to being transparent and open about what they are receiving in term, from extractive industries. It's a great initiative, has taken off in a few countries, needs to really be pushed in other countries. It doesn't cost a lot of money, just it doesn't cost really any money. It requires a commitment to be open and transparent. On the other side, there's a push on publish what you pay for companies that make payments to be more transparent about those payments. And that's been enacted in law here as part of the Dodd-Frank bill that companies that are listed as part of the SEC are now required to make public their payments to other governments for natural resources. Eric Postel at USAID and others pushed very hard for that to get through. It's a big step forward. But if you have commitments from countries, governments themselves to be transparent, and companies that are making the payments to be transparent, then people know. And I think that information, that knowledge, gives power for citizens to hold their governments accountable, make sure that revenues do come in, and 
that they are uh, spent effectively going forward. Laura, do you want to? Sure. I mean, I think that there's a lot of variation, right? And and a place like Kenya, I would agree with the assessment that that the collection of tribes is still very much an issue. But you know, there there are other places where national identity has strengthened, um, and that doesn't mean that that people exclusively hold a national identity. I mean, it is possible to hold multiple identities at once. I'm I'm a Texan. Right. I mean, you all know I, I hold a national identity that is not the American. Um, in addition to to my other to to my identity as a U.S. citizen, um, and, and I think that you know you you do find places where, um, where where identity can 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 become something different than what you think it is. I mean, we were discussing this morning over breakfast about the DRC and how national identity in DRC is much stronger than you might think it is, considering that the government doesn't do anything for the Congolese and hasn't done so for 30 years. Um, but, but people really do have this strong sense of we are Congolese. Now, part of that is in response to we are not Rwandan. We are not these outsiders. It's, it's very much a sort of our team versus their team kind of thing. Um, but it also relates to you know things like the breakdown of traditional authority, um, and and the breakdown of any kind of, of mechanisms for enforcing rule of law at the very local level. And I think that Mwangi's point about the you know that laws are not enough, constitutions are not enough. Um, the DRC has the most progressive law against rape in the world. Um, it's more progressive than than the United States law, but of course it's meaningless uh, because it can't be enforced. Um, there are no courts that that can that can really manage it on the scale that needs to be managed. Um, and I think that you know this issue of how you build the rule of law at the most basic level, how you get people to believe that if they play according to the rules of the game, their government will play according to the rules of the game and everyone else will play and, and contracts will be enforced and agreements will, will not fall apart, um, particularly in fragile states, is, is a real puzzle um, and, and one that we don't have a good answer for. But I think it has to start at the very local level. Jeffrey, to bring you in, where do you, where do you fall in this argument of how you strengthen good governance and democracy in Africa, which of course is the bedrock for economic development and for its growth? Well, I wanted to just add uh, one more uh, point to this, which is that the good governance in Africa also depends on good governance uh, on our side. Uh, the mm -hmm. source countries, for example, of the, the major mining and oil companies. Mm -hmm. Take the case of uh, the DRC. Uh, the DRC started uh, its independence uh, with a, um, a Belgian and CIA-inspired secessionist movement of the Katanga province. Uh, and it started with the murder of Lumumba, uh, who was a, a legitimate, popular, democratic leader uh, of the country, uh, who was a troublemaker because the copper interests in uh, Belgium and uh, elsewhere uh, viewed him as, uh, as a barrier to their wealth. Now, that was a very extreme case at, at the beginning, but the U.S. put in Mobutu, uh, and uh, we made the history of that country to a very significant extent after Leopold. Uh, so we wrecked the Congo repeatedly uh, for decades. Uh, the CIA, uh, the Belgian government, uh, Leopold. Uh, and then we say, why can't these countries get their act together? And the truth of the matter is that it has been uh, a, a tremendous uh, bad behavior on many sides. Almost every time there's oil at stake, uh, there are big country interests from the outside that are meddling. And very often they make a mess of the local governance uh, because they're backing their companies. Uh, and they have been, uh, therefore, major agents in instability of the resource management. I know when uh, Ghana tried to raise the price that it was selling hydroelectric power from basically giving it away for free to an American aluminum company to something that was uh, even uh, just a, a marginal improvement. The U.S. company threatened to get uh, Ghana punished in Washington in countless ways if it dared to pursue this. And believe me, Ghana backed down several times because the lobbying power of these companies was so great. I see this happening all over the place right now. This is why uh, Section 1504 of Dodd-Frank that Steve mentioned is really potentially such an important breakthrough uh, because it's now American law. And I'm hoping that the European Union adopts a, a similar uh, message. But we should really understand 
how much the United States and Europe have destabilized Africa on, on many occasions over the last 60 years and over natural resources, uh, over exactly the kinds of development issues we're talking about. It doesn't end till today. We have to absolutely be vigilant. You know, once I uh, went to India, just to take a different case, the American ambassador grabbed me and said, you better tell your Indian friends to uh, honor that contract with Enron. Uh, you know, that was uh, just moments before Enron was started. <coughs> but it, it showed how deeply intertwined U.S. foreign policy is with our own companies. Well, and me, this is very bad behavior. Let me ask you, let me pick up on what you just said, bringing in the U.S. and its engagement with Africa and obviously to the panel as a whole. What is your assessment of the way the Obama administration is engaging with Africa right now? What are your thoughts? I, I want the president to spend more than one day in sub-Saharan Africa during his second term. <laughs> And people feel the same way in this room. Uh, to the, to the, the people here, I mean, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, you hear what Jeff has said and the context he's given about, of past relationships. So I completely agree with Jeff and, and hope that that, uh, that that happens. I suspect that it will. Obviously, the president had some problems uh, that he had to deal with during his first administration. Having said that, to be a little bit uh, in defense of the administration, which I was part of for three years, <laughs> Uh, Secretary Clinton spent a lot of time on the continent. Um, the president was deeply involved in the Sudan issue and in many ways was, was pretty important to bringing that issue to final resolution. So he, he has been engaged in that issue and several others. We did, in the context of, of essentially a frozen foreign aid budget, allocate uh, almost $2 billion more to sub-Saharan Africa, largely through the Feed the Future initiative. We do have HIV AIDS uh, treatment up to over 5 million people, so the administration has deepened that in many ways. So it's a, it's a, it's a start. AGOA, you know, there's big questions on what the next steps would be in AGOA. I would love to, to see a big step forward in terms of moving towards quota-free, duty-free. Uh, that's frankly less of an executive branch um, set of issues than a congressional branch. The, I think there's widespread agreement in the executive branch. We'd love to move forward on AGOA. And, and frankly, on a lot of trade issues, the big roadblocks on that are more uh, in Congress, uh, frankly, on both uh, sides of the political uh, aisle. Um, I do think economically, one of the ways that the administration that will look, uh, that you can look towards a, a, a deepening engagement is through power. Jeff mentioned the off-grid stuff. Uh, there is a movement towards thinking more about how the United States can use the, fund, the money that it has to leverage private sector investment and to, to, especially in the power sector, both for on-grid <clears throat> and off-grid power. So I think that's one specific way that I suspect that we will see uh, more, movement, uh, more movement going forward. Laura, how do you want to see uh, Sure, I mean, I, th I think the fact that, that you know, the, the Obama administration released its Africa strategy in the last half mm -hmm. of the last year of the first term um, shows what kind of priority it is. Um, but, you know, that, that's also, that, that's, the, that's what a priority it is for every administration. Africa is always a low priority for American administrations. Um, and I think that, that that's, that's going to be increasingly problematic in the years ahead. We are now importing as much oil every year from the African continent as we are from the Persian Gulf states. Um, and we are seeing a move toward the deployment of more and more U.S. forces. Um, there are certainly more and more traditional geostrategic political interests that the United States has on the continent. Um, and it would behoove us to make a, make a stronger um, move toward developing strategies, toward developing policies. Um, and, and quite frankly, policies are, are you know, the, I mean, the, one of the key pillars of the, of the Obama administration strategy is youth engagement, um, which is all well and good. I mean, that, that's not a bad thing. But inviting leaders of the diaspora to the White House, while that's a good thing, I mean, can you imagine that being a key element of administration policy with China? or with Afghanistan, and, and that sort of being something that is, is valued on its own. Um, I, I mean, I think that, that many Africans have, have been very disappointed uh, by the administration's engagement on the continent, um, by the sort of uh, involvement in conflict resolution, which in many quarters is perceived as too little, too late, um, and, and certainly with a focus more on getting American citizens out of harm's way than on actually engaging in meaningful uh, peace building activities. And I, you know, I would like to see us move forward on that. And like Professor Sachs, I would like to see the president actually spend some time in Africa, spend some time talking with 
people on the ground who, who can really give him a, a sense of what their problems are and what is needed to solve those problems. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we can hope, we hope for better uh, results this time. Uh, we understand the constraints that the president uh, has been facing, but, uh, and uh, we, we, we do think that uh, it will be better. And it's true that uh, actually Africa does not have constituents in, 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 in America. There is not a single senator who would lose a seat because they didn't vote for an African bill. So, we, we, you know, Africa does not really have those type of constituencies. So how do you create constituents? You have to go to the private sector. And I think building relationships with private sector so they have a stake in Africa will be the key thing. And I believe that um, if the president were to focus on really engaging the private sector, uh, you know, doing whatever is possible, whether it's uh, tax uh, uh, privileges, you know, some benefit to invest in Africa, uh, I think that would be necessary. But on the other hand, uh, we think that uh, China, Brazil, Turkey, and all other countries that are flocking to Africa uh, will be an incentive for Africa, for the United States to actually act. I believe that some of the actions, that's my personal view, is that uh, the United States is also responding to these other countries, which is a very bad thing for a great country like the United States to be following uh, for its policy on Africa to be determined by what's happening by other countries, in my view. You, you mentioned the sea, well, you brought up China. <clears throat> what is the feeling here among you about China's actions in Africa and its role in its further development? Does it give you cause for concern, the deluge of money that they're putting in? So, uh, my view on this is that there are great opportunities as well as challenges. China is bringing in uh, money for infrastructure. Uh, they're bringing in expertise in many, uh, in many areas. They're bringing in markets. Um, uh, they're, they're creating a, a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, at the same time, there are a number of challenges uh, in, in terms of, of uh, whether or not they're supporting good governance or perhaps undermining good governance uh, and, and what their broader agenda might be in terms of resource extraction. It's a little bit... Uh, uh, well, I'd say humorous, except it's a little bit sad that uh, some people in the West uh, wag their fingers at China for being all about resource extraction. As Jeff has already mentioned, we have kind of a history <laughs> ourselves of doing the same thing. So uh, I'm not sure that we can wag our fingers uh, uh, too much. I think that uh, a couple of things. One is that, that uh, the extent to which these opportunities will really be taken advantage of in a positive way is fundamentally up to the, the countries themselves that China is dealing with. And many countries are, are moving in very responsible ways to say, we want Chinese investment. We love to partner with you. We want you to do it in an open, transparent, competitive way. And most Chinese companies are more than happy to do that if that's the rules. Uh, when those are not the rules, they'll behave in other ways as well. So a lot of this will depend on the actions of governments themselves. Second, it will depend on the international community. We're really bad at not inviting China to the table as an international partner. In lots of countries, the traditional donors get together and the Chinese aren't there. And <clears throat> you know, you ask some of the donors, why not? Well, they see things differently. Well, that's exactly why you want them at the table. That's exactly why you want them at the table. And uh, so whether it's the biggest level of, of having more influence at the IMF or the World Bank of the United Nations and international institutions, or whether it's a, at the country level where traditional donor groups get together, we've got to bring them in the tent work with them, listen to them, work as partners, uh, and do things like in Liberia where <clears throat> there was a hospital destroyed by the war uh, and the United States was not in a position to actually build the hospital, but we could provide the supplies to the hospital. Chinese stepped up and said, well, we can build the hospital. They built the hospital, we supply the hospital. It's a great partnership and people are getting the health care they need because neither side was stubborn and because President Sirleaf stepped in and said, can you please uh, work together? And both sides did, and there was a great success. So the more that we're able to work together in those kinds of ways, the more that this will be a positive set of relationships rather than a negative one. Professor Sachs, do you see it in the same way that it's a, a positive relationship between Africa and China right now? Some say it's very unequal. They raise concerns about labor standards, environmental contracts. Well, first, uh, simply on a macro scale, uh, China's demand for uh, primary commodities has been a key factor in pulling up Africa's growth. 
Uh, we have a high world prices for natural resources in general. China is a fundamental factor in that. So uh, Africa should definitely pray for China's uh, macroeconomic health. Uh, it's it's a major part of uh, of Africa's dynamics. Second, uh, on the whole, uh, China is uh, behaving uh, like a constructive uh, uh, major power in Africa, in that uh, it's providing a lot of finance, uh, a lot of diplomatic support, uh, and uh, doing uh, a lot of useful things. I would say that uh, when it comes to corporate governance, Chinese companies are not good. Uh, the norms uh, of uh, uh, behavior that major Western companies more or less uh, have to apply these days because of law or reputation do not apply right now to a lot of Chinese companies. Uh, and a lot of uh, Chinese companies are creating havoc environmentally uh, in uh, Ghana, for example, ripping up the landscape for mining. Uh, there's a lot that's going on because China's not part of uh, the kind of EITI or Dodd-Frank uh, process. And this is where Steve's idea of bringing uh, China uh, into uh, uh, around the table on what is responsible uh, stewardship is really important. Uh, that's for Chinese uh, government policies vis-a-vis -vis their own companies. Uh, China also discovered something, of course, that the Western companies discovered a while ago, which is a disaster for Africa and that is the tax havens. If you look at how Chinese investment reaches Africa, it's through the British Virgin Islands, it's through the Caymans, it's through Bermuda, it's through anonymity. Uh, and this comes back to the fact that uh, Africa absolutely bleeds resources, uh, corruption, uh, capital flight, uh, aid that uh, gets transferred, uh, natural resource royalties that are, are not paid or are paid into private accounts through the tax haven. So I just wanted to raise that as another area where the international system uh, basically is an invitation to, to corruption. Uh, and uh, the international system really has to take care of our own behavior better. But I do want to say one more thing. Steve did a fabulous job uh, as chief economist of USAID in bringing attention to all of these issues and to getting AID's policies very, very pragmatic, very focused, very targeted. So uh, I, I really think uh, we owe Steve a lot for that. Uh, there's, there's a huge legacy there, Steve. Laura. Sure. Um, you know, yeah, I agree that the fear of China and Africa is greatly overstated. Um, and China is offering to African states something that no one else is offering, and that is infrastructure development and visas. Um, you know, th there are, <laughs> China is building roads in the Eastern Congo. No other aid agency is going to engage hold, in that kind of activity. Hold that thought because I do want to put that to the audience very quickly before you go on. She said that the fear of China in Africa is greatly overstated. A show of hands as to how many of you agree with that. Hmm. I'm somewhat unpopular. You're That's somewhat okay. Unpopular. It's not the first time. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think that you, you look, if you go to Beijing today, it is, it is full of African leaders who are there for bilateral exchanges, there for discussions. It is full of African students um, who are able to get visas and go study in numbers that are not possible given Western restrictions on immigration and student visas and requirements for holding ludicrous amounts of cash when all you want to do is go study for a university degree. Um, if I am an African looking at the opportunities of what the East is offering me versus the West, for many people, what the East is offering is more appealing and, more importantly, more accessible. Um, now, some of those people engaging in bilateral exchanges are going to get lessons on repression. Um, I, I mean, it, it's not as though the U.S. Didn't, didn't also do that for a long time, right? I mean, we, we, we did all kinds of shenanigans with intelligence services and those sorts of things. Um, people learn how to block the Internet. Um, but I think that, you know, it's very important for, for U.S. policymakers to, to deal with the reality that there is um, someone else out there and that it is far better to approach that as a partnership than to turn it into a competition um, between two sides. And I think that you know, we are seeing an, an unfortunate incident of the latter kind of engagement with Rwanda right now. You know, Rwanda has very much been pursuing, and it looks like they're about to get, significant uh, Chinese aid investment um, in the aftermath of the withdrawal of Western aid um, over Rwanda's support for the M23 rebels in Congo.
Um, so, I mean, I think that, that it's a mixed bag, and I think that there certainly are problems, the environmental issues, like you mentioned. Um, in Congo, you know, the, Ch the Chinese and DRC realized early on that, that bringing only foreign workers and not employing Africans was not going to work anymore, and so they, they do hire significant numbers of Congolese for these infrastructure projects. But the pay is quite low, um, even, even by Congolese standards where, where unemployment is so rampant. I mean, people look at this and they say, you know, $3 a day is not not worth my time um, to, to go out and join you in these projects. And I think that you know, those sorts of challenges um, are very important. But you have to think of this in terms of who's offering what and who is bringing what to the table. And can we engage on things like the hospital in Liberia that, that Steve mentioned? Can we find ways to say, OK, if you build the road, we can help farmers with getting their products to market on that road. Um, if you will repair the airport, if you will, for, for the love of God, install radar in Congolese airports, that would, that would be the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, we can train people to use it. You know, there, there are a lot of opportunities there for, for the different kinds of aid that the different groups are willing to do. I think that's a, Mwangi, you set us off on the China track, so I'm going to open it up to the audience, if that's okay. I think it's a great point. Um, we're taking questions. I do not just expect a bandage treatment for a cancer that is bleeding the continent. I was expecting for him to take a very bold initiative in his second term. Uh, but most importantly, I think it's up to us, the citizens on this end, and the Africans, to put pressure on him. Make it look him so bad that he has to do something. I think until we do that, we can't get nowhere. And lastly, I'll say this much. If we do not get the international community involved in the development of Africa, i.e. the German Bushwa fan system that helped German after the Second World War, should be, that model should be used for Africa, where all the global interests come together to help us. If the US does not get involved quickly with China, Rear Earth, which is the next wave of production for the 21st century, China has already controlled 95% of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to pick up on that briefly? I'm going to ask a brief response to questions. And take, she says take a couple. Shall I take several? Should we take several? Does everyone prefer yeah. that? I like to get people to answer immediately, but I will go with the, this is a democracy at Brookings. <laughs> <laughs> um, to Professor Sachs' initiative about the health workers, research shows that, US, or that using health workers to promote hand washing and sanitation is a very cost effective way of uh, using their time. Have you given thought to using this million health worker plan to promote access to water and sanitation? And you, you can just hand it to your partner there, and then we'll take a third there, and then we'll start some answers. OK, my name is Samson John uh, from Ethiopian Embassy. Uh, my uh, question goes to uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Um, you told us some of the initiatives that you propose to be good for Africa ahead of. Then um, hope, uh, so far as the MDG is concerned, some countries are uh, in a good shape in achieving the MDG by the 2050. Among those countries, it will be the one. So doesn't it show that our country is on the right track, or in general, some of the African countries uh, who are about to achieve those MDGs are in the right track in meeting those challenges uh, that were mentioning by uh, the contributors in the, the state? Thank you. Thank you. All right. And the last, the fourth question, and then we'll take some answers. Uh, hello, I'm Shari Berenbach, the president of the US African Development Foundation. Um, and this is really a question to any of the panelists. And one of the, the big trends that I see in Africa that I think is so very important is the massive urbanization that is taking place. Particularly when we talk about the youth and um, the kind of opportunities, the job dimensions. And I'm just wondering that the, the, the massive urbanization and really what the appropriate public sector, private sector response is to really create more livable communities in these urban um, regions. Uh, perhaps it's something we should be talking about. Okay, thank you. We'll pause there for a moment and take some answers. Uh, let's start with this issue of pressure being placed on the president. How realistic is that? Well, I'm not sure he's going to respond too much to pressure, uh, but uh, maybe a little bit. So some, some pressure for him to do more uh, and for the administration to do more is a good thing. I think there is potential for greater engagement. As I say, there, there actually has been a lot more engagement <clears throat> than they're given credit for in terms of the Feed the Future program, in terms of funding, in terms of HIV AIDS, and, and several other things. But there's scope to really expand that uh, in, in, in the second year. So some pressure for more uh, high-level visits from him, I think, would be great. I think 
pushing for more innovative uses, again, for uh, funding power uh, and electricity, pushing on the Feed the Future initiative, where they're already committed and started this new initiative under the administration, which they can own, and to really bring that to the next level, uh, both uh, for the U.S. alone and for the G8, uh, would be uh, an agenda that I think uh, is quite feasible and that they would be open to for the second, uh, second administration. Anyone else want to comment, <coughs> Laura, or? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, uh, there are so many initiatives. There are some good initiatives, by the way, by the Obama administration. I have to agree that they are small in scale, some of them. Uh, Feed the Future is, uh, is a huge program, but there are several others which are but, uh, relatively small in scale. In terms of uh, pressure, I think uh, whether, whether we talk about pressure to get more aid is good, but that can be very easily reversed by another administration. I think what we need is more long-term relationship, which can only come by creating uh, beneficiaries. And these beneficiaries would have to be in the part of the United States. And that's why the private sector need to be, uh, to be involved. And in terms of pressure, let me say that uh, there are several, I, I would say like people like the constituency for Africa, uh, the, the Black uh, America, the, the Black Caucus, Congressional Caucus. There's been actually several groups in the in the, in the U.S. that have been putting pressure. CCA, uh, the Corporate Council on Africa. I think they have been putting pressure on the administration. So I think there is, we just need to to get more uh, critical mass on that area. Uh, Flora, if you don't want to comment, I'm going to bring in um, Professor Sachs. Um, Professor Sachs, if you want to comment on that, or go straight to the next two questions, which were addressed to you on hand washing and um, personal hygiene, and also this issue of the MDGs, and you know, what, it what it says about uh, where these countries are on the road to, to development, or road of development. Yeah, let, let me first say on uh, US foreign policy, of course, uh, the US, for all the reasons uh, that were mentioned, uh, should be paying a lot more attention. That's why we're here today. Uh, Africa is now a billion people. It will be two billion people uh, soon enough. Uh, there's a lot of uh, economic dynamism and importance. We have to guard against the U.S. viewing Africa from the optic of oil and terror, which are two of the favorite subjects of the United States. So the Sahel has, Afri has uh, U.S. attention now because of Mali uh, and uh, Al Qaeda and the Maghreb and, and uh, all of that. This is a terribly uh, narrow perspective uh, that will be very damaging if it's pursued through drones and uh, security as opposed through development in broader uh, areas of cooperation. So Mwangi is exactly right that this has to be an economic base, culture, sports, uh, human interchange. Uh, uh, Laura's uh, point about uh, students uh, studying could not be more pertinent. It's just an absolutely wonderful point. Uh, that we really should take on and, and, uh, and be aware of uh, that reality. Uh, let me turn to the community health workers. They're just great for so many things. We have a significant project with Unilever uh, exactly around community education on sanitation, hand washing, uh, use of soap, uh, which is Uni Unilever's uh, product uh, interest, but uh, it's a broader thing. People are uh, saved. Their lives are saved. Kids are are saved uh, by these very, very simple means. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that big companies like Unilever are, are pressing the point and want it scaled up. And we at the UN need to really help uh, governments uh, to scale it up. And I do view the community health workers as an absolutely central uh, point of contact between the health system and uh, people in their, in their real lives. So they can save a lot of lives uh, they can bring malaria deaths down to almost zero. They can, as you say, help with uh, hygiene and sanitation, safe childbirth, antenatal visits, uh, well baby monitoring. It's amazing all the good things that, that can come out of this. On, on the MDG front, I'll be in Addis uh, in, in about five days, uh, um, meeting with the government to, to exactly talk about these things. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, obviously, uh, Ethiopia has made a, a lot of progress in general, uh, the African scene is one of progress, but very mixed uh, progress, exactly the complicated uh, tableau that uh, Steve talked about uh, earlier and that has been implicit in what we've been saying. There are areas of uh, tremendous advance. There are areas of neglect. 
the big disappointment for me, obviously, in, in the MDGs was that the donor side did not hold up its side of the bargain. Uh, very explicit commitments that were made in 2002 and 2005 uh, on increased aid for Africa never were realized. Now, I just wanted to point out in that regard uh, one thing and a challenge for everybody here. The single most important development, in my view, in Africa's uh, uh, success in the last 10 years has been the penetration of information technology, and especially mobile. And that came without any aid at all, uh, because there turned out to be a business model that made it possible for a massive expansion. And I would say, by the way, to Ethiopians, liberalize, <laughs> let in the companies, and you'll get a lot more, you'll get a lot more phones uh, out of that than the Chinese monopoly. But that's a, a digression. To, ba to come back to this, here's a business model that reached the poorest of the poor, transformative. The real holy grail of development right now in Africa is can, can the markets do this in two other areas? One is electricity. Could we get a tipping point through prepay and other systems to have really a, a revolution of electrification on a market basis? And second, could we get a revolution of agricultural seasonal financing on a market basis? We're pretty close to the tipping point on those two crucial areas. Now, you know, everybody knows I'm almost a fanatic for development aid, so I'm not mm -hmm. saying do away with it. But I am saying that if we could figure out market forces that would really work at scale in the way that they've worked for telecoms in the areas of infrastructure uh, and agriculture, Africa is absolutely going to boom. And so those are two huge intellectual, practical, and business challenges uh, that I would uh, hope that somebody in the audience is going to crack. If I can get a quick answer on the issue of um, this rapid urbanization we're seeing in Africa and what the appropriate responses should be to that. Um, and then we'll open it up for another batch of questions. Laura? Sure. So this is something I'm also I'm very interested in. I'm, I'm involved in a project in Edo State in Nigeria, um, looking Edo State in Nigeria in Benin City. Um, looking at um, why there has been a sudden burst of infrastructure improvement in the city. Um, and, and if you go to Edo State today, I mean, you would see many, many paved roads, improved drainage systems, improved electrical access. Um, and this is, this is really bizarre, right, <laughs> on many levels. And, it, and what it comes down to is essentially the personal leadership of the governor. Uh, governor he prefers to be called Comrade uh, Oshio um, and, and the comrade really just kind of made a decision that his legitimacy would come in part um, from his responsiveness to, to the community and to, to citizens through, through this program of infrastructure development. Um, and it worked quite well for him. He was, he was resoundingly re-elected uh, early last year. Um, and, and there's reason to believe that that re-election was, was quite legitimate. Um, what we're interested in is can you get that accountability to, to expand? Both is it replicable in other places, um, but also is it replicable in other sectors? So we're testing it on, on, in the crime and violence prevention and, and um, response sector right now. Um, but you know, it, it seems to have a lot to do with leadership. It seems to have a lot to do with commitments. I agree with Professor Sachs, the role of data um, and, and you know, mapping technologies, these kinds of things, and, and participatory community-based mapping, which I think is something that is greatly underutilized. You know, that there are people doing things in communities that, who do not get any attention, who are never going to be on CNN, who are never going to be written about in the New York Times, um, but who are making quite a difference and, and you know, engaging in these data gathering techniques, using the wisdom and knowledge of local leaders um, and of people in the community is, is really an effective way to identify and scale and, and strengthen these activities. And I think that you know, there's a lot of opportunity there, but it does come down to this sort of how do you make that leap to where people view their, their officials as accountable. Could I just add one thing on that? I think our friend um, in the front row asked a question. He mentioned that, you know, this issue of corruption mm -hmm. um, hampering growth and, and how corruption hampers investment and, and that American companies are not willing to invest in Africa because they see it as corruption. And I, th I think that's a really important observation. Um, but what we see is that in the countries where governments have made 
a very strong stand against corruption and are trying to, to make it very difficult for their officials to ask for bribes and that sort of thing. Those are, it's not a coincidence as those are the places where we're seeing some of the highest levels of growth. I mean, I, I certainly am quite critical of Rwanda for, for the near total lack of political freedom there, but give them credit. That is, that is a place where it is much easier to start a business uh, than it is anywhere else in East Africa. Um, it's much easier to get in there. It's much less expensive. And, and that is certainly tied to investment. And the more governments that can lower those barriers that keep people out. I mean, I think another one is barriers to immigration, visa fees. You know, the, it should not be more difficult for a Ghanaian to get a visa to go to Nigeria than it is for me. Um, but, but most of those, the visa regimes throughout Africa, it is. Um, and it's very difficult for people to move. And if, you know, if we're going to say that we, we believe in the value and power of free markets for development, we have to believe in the power of free labor markets and in letting people be able to move for educational and for employment opportunities if they need to. Thank you. Let's take another batch of questions. <coughs> oh, lots of hands. Um, okay, let's start to the right here in the in the green, and then oh, there's only, and then the lady there on the left next, with her hand up. Hello, there. my name is uh, Andrew Puglisi, and I have a question. Um, is there grassroots cultural or social demand for increasing education opportunity and success? Um, if there isn't, how important is that? Sorry, can you repeat that? Is there a demand oh. for? Is there, uh, are, is there grassroots cultural or social demand for increasing education opportunity and success? If there isn't, how important is that to uh, increasing educational success? Mm -hmm. um, and how can grassroots social demand be increased or utilized? Thank you. Um, lady over there, and then the gentleman behind him. Yes, there. Lady, go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Paulette Lee. I'm a communications uh, specialist. I've lived and worked in Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Ghana. And um, I'd like to zero in, ask, ask you to zero in, please, on the issue of U.S. aid to Africa. What should it look like? We've touched on other models uh, in this discussion today. We've talked about a little bit about the reduction in the amount of aid. But there is a huge... Um, literature now on the, the the problems with aid. So, what is your opinion about that? Thank, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. There and then. Steve. So, I'm getting the gentleman here first. If you give your question, then you next. Thank Steve you. Landy, Manchester Trade, great panel. Congratulations to AGI. Um, I basically hear a contradiction. On one hand. Africa, 60 years of independence, is grabbing its own destiny, has its own ideas, is in the lead. On the other hand, a lot of do-gooders, oh, we should do this, this, and this for Africa. Somewhere we're going to have to balance that out. <laughs> Let me just make, make two quick questions. One, we cannot dictate to Africa the rules on corruption. Africa must do that. We cannot dictate the rules on corruption with Dodd-Frank while China and other countries play by other rules. Question, can we have a conditionality policy as we have it without having agreement among all the players, including the Africans and the way we're moving? Second question, erudite, but Steve Sachs, uh, Dr. Sachs is an old trade guy and he'll know the significance of this. We have a serious contradiction in terms of US policy towards regional integration that we must get Africanists to know about. We cannot be supporting special preferences for least developed countries at the same time as we support regional integration in Africa because one quarter of the African countries are not least developed. The Europeans know that and they are forcing on the Africans what they call economic partnership agreements on the more advanced countries. Again, I won't go too much detail. I teach a course at Johns Hopkins, everyone can take it. But the bottom line is that unless Africanists become aware of what's going on in places like the WTO and going on in Brussels, all our comments about regional integration will come to nothing because the Europeans will either close their markets to key African countries or they will make it impossible to create a common duty. And let me stop there. I'm sorry for being overnight. <laughs> no, it's always appreciated. <laughs> Hi, uh, Connie Freeman, Syracuse University. I'd like to pick up on Mwangi's comment in his opening statement about the need for better African governance of African resources. 
and the fact that this could generate so many resources for development that that almost obviate the need for aid. And I'd like to hear a little further discussion about how to better go about that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a batch of questions. We're, going, we're about to go over. Um, so I'm going to ask you to all keep your answers brief. Um, but I'm going to start with you, Laura, on the question of education sure. and the grassroots demand. Sure. Grassroots, demand. grassroots demand is extraordinarily high for education. Um, and, and parents and the people who run the schools, I mean, I think there's wide awareness of the inadequacy of the, of the situation. I mean, these are not, these are not people who, who don't want children to be educated. They're just working in environments with very limited resources and very limited opportunities. I, I can't tell you, I, I did my dissertation research on education in the Eastern DRC, and I can't tell you how many of my subjects when our interview would conclude would ask me questions about pedagogy, would ask me about active learning techniques and how can I integrate that into the classroom and would you come back and train my teachers in this and, and those sorts of things. I mean, they want to do it. Um, it's not trendy, it's not sexy, it's not something that gets a lot of attention in, in aid programs, um, but it's something where there's a lot of opportunity. And there's a lot of opportunity in, in this area, I think, for people who, who want to help African communities in meaningful ways, but who are not private sector, you know, large investors, who are not um, government donors, but, but people who, who really want to make a difference in communities. I mean, I think that, that there are many, many opportunities and very high demand there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to keep this moving rapidly along, and I'm going to put the question first to you, Stephen, this issue of what should USA to Africa look like? Well, um, we could talk for week. Well, we've Let's talked for decades about this, so, uh, uh, <laughs> so I'll try to, uh, try to be brief. First, um, in terms of overall aid effectiveness, most of the research that you mentioned that points out the uh, problems with aid uh, and, and that has a negative view gets very high profile. The research that comes out that says aid is effective gets very low profile. Most of the research that's been done shows that aid has a modest positive effect. I just came out with a couple of co-authors, a research article in, in, in uh, an economics journal called The Economics Journal, actually, um, that does a comprehensive look at a lot of the studies that have found uh, very little relationship between aid and growth and find those studies quite flawed. And we find that with careful piece of research that you can find a, a positive relationship. So overall, the record on aid is, as I say, modest positive. Having said that, there are huge ways that foreign assistance can be improved. And again, the Obama administration has finally taken, uh, uh, actually finally did it right at the beginning of the administration, big steps in this, pro in, in this process, finally, because it's many decades overdue. And the Bush administration, uh, for all the positive things it did in Africa, it actually made U.S. foreign assistance less effective in many ways by fragmentation and uh, by consolidation and, and weakening USAID in many ways. But there's an agenda that is in place that is being implemented, and the key is to continue this implementation. USAID has hired 800 new foreign service officers, which is going to be the next generation of qualified technical leadership at USAID. They are already in place. Uh, they're being trained, they're going out to the field, the new generation is there. Uh, they've instituted a new monitoring and evaluation policy to take a strong look at what works, what doesn't look, what doesn't work. The agency is committed to making 200 of those evaluations pu public this year. If they do half of that, it's going to change how people view USAID and how the agency itself uh, moves forward in terms of what works uh, uh, and, 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 and what doesn't work. Uh, we need to allocate more funding towards agriculture and towards power, which have been underemphasized. That's already uh, underway. Even with the budget constraints we all face, funding for Africa is up almost $2 billion in this administration uh, relative to 2008. Uh, and we need to continue that with big focus on agriculture uh, uh, and, and, and on power. Uh, there are many other steps that are, that are underway to try to streamline. Uh, the way that we operate to try to uh, focus what we do. Some of those have been successful, others uh, less. But, but uh, to, to, to focus more on monitoring and evaluation, to, uh, for the U.S. government to work with other donors in a more harmonized fashion so that we're not just out there on our own, but are actually working under the leadership of recipient countries, at least the well-governed recipient countries, to decide what their priorities are and to get donors to work together. Uh, it, it is a long sought goal which we have only begun to move forward. And I 
would want to urge African governments to be much more aggressive in demanding, because it's got to come from them at the end of the day, that donors work together towards goals that are established by the developing countries themselves. In well-governed countries, I don't, I'm not arguing for this in Zimbabwe at the moment, uh, but in well-governed countries that have good uh, development agendas, we need to be much more responsive to the priorities that they set uh, and working together. We're far better at this now, I think, than we were five years ago, mm -hmm. but there's a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, Professor Sachs, if I could bring you in to comment briefly, because I know you've written extensively on this, the, no the issue of U.S. aid to Africa, but also to pick up on the comment made by uh, your erudite colleague as to um, we cannot dictate uh, to Africa rules on corruption and referencing Dodd-Frank. I want to get your thoughts on those, those two issues quickly. Yeah, just very briefly, aid that is well targeted and that is taken seriously as a development uh, instrument works. And that's why the success on malaria and uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS, has been so marked. So that if we focus, if we use technologies effectively, if we help uh, poor people or uh, public goods provision uh, where markets uh, can't do it alone, we can have a very big success. It is... Uh, not good for the United States to be spending 25 times more uh, roughly uh, on military approaches to our foreign policy than on development approaches to our foreign policy. Maybe 20 to 25 times, roughly 700 billion on the military versus about 30 billion on all development assistance. This is not good for the United States. It does not uh, deliver uh, the goods even for, from the point of view of U.S. interests and U.S. security, much less from the needs of very poor people. Uh, so I think that we could do a lot better. Um, and this literature, by the way, as Steve said, uh, and as, as he has contributed importantly to, is so vague. Uh, it's not really about whether you can do things. It's about what should be done and how to do them. There are tremendously important positive things that can be done and that ought to be done uh, in agriculture, in disease, in infrastructure, uh, in other areas that we've talked about. In terms of the uh, question of uh, corruption and accountability, I'm afraid that I believe uh, uh, we need to get moving. Not every country is going to do it. Uh, China should be encouraged uh, to do a lot more than it's doing. But for heaven's sake, we can do a lot better uh, than, than we've been doing. And the truth is, uh, as I <clears throat> mentioned earlier, we have invited a kind of global lawlessness through the tax havens. Uh, these tax havens are not just tax havens, they're anonymity uh, zones as well. They protect illicit money, and they allow uh, U.S. and Chinese and European companies to act with impunity in poor countries by putting the supposed corporate uh, governance uh, into uh, the British Virgin Islands or the Caymans or Bermuda or some other place uh, that allows you to launder identity and, and uh, legal accountability. So we need to clean up our act. Uh, China will be part of that as well, uh, but let's not wait, quote unquote, for perfection, giving ourselves a license uh, for illicit behavior until everybody behaves, that's uh, obviously a, a guarantee of uh, getting nothing done. So let's move. This Dodd-Frank uh, 1504 could turn out to be very important. Uh, it's just getting started. Uh, let's give it strong political support. Thank you. And uh, Mangi, as we are in your house, <laughs> I'm going to give you the final word, particularly on that question of better governance yeah. of resources and if there if you want to point to any specific countries that are doing a good job that we could look to as a model I, I think the, the key that, that to, to, to really natural resource governance is uh, information uh, the citizens need to know the information they need to know what is in these contracts you can get that information for example in Ghana you cannot get it in Uganda you are you are you can you see a big difference in even in the negotiation stage and all that so if the citizens have information they can then start questioning the government. And so, so I think the issue is getting accountable government information and that will generate the transparency in, in contracting at every stage and even the revenue utilization. All right, and there we must leave it, everyone. If you could please join me in giving a, a warm round of applause for all our panelists.
Wine Guest Comenius, Steve Radler, Jeffrey Sachs, and Laura C. Thank you so much, and thank you for joining us. I know we went over by about seven minutes, but thank you for joining us, and I hope, I hope you enjoyed it.